Did you watch the Oscars this year? I did not. I just have a message for the Oscar committee. Stop having 80-year-old men announce the best picture. They mess it up. Don't you remember Warren Beatty? I think my favorite win from the Oscars this year was Zone of Interest for Best Sound. Because not only was it the best sound, technically the best sound, but it used sound in a dramatic way and it used sound as part of the production design. And, it, and sound was just a, an integral part of the whole story. And I thought Oppenheimer was just going to win everything and it was. I was so glad that the movie that deserved it the most actually won it. I was too very glad in a similar way that Godzilla Minus One got some recognition yeah. at the Oscars. It was such a powerful movie and it made such an unexpected impact here in the United States. Well, for anyone who cares, I did see all 10 of the Best Picture nominees and here are my rankings. Number one was The Holdovers. Number two, Poor Things. Number three, Zone of Interest. Barbie and Killers of the Flower Moon are tied for me, pretty much. And then it would be American Fiction, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Anatomy of a Fall, and Poor Things. I just recently finally saw Poor Things. I was sad that I missed it in theaters. I loved it. Wait, did I say Poor Things is the last one? Yes. I meant Past Lives. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Poor Things was number two. Yeah, I love I, I love poor things. I wish I could go back to one of my past lives and correct that mistake. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what some of you folks at home might not know is that today, when we're shooting this episode, it is St. Patrick's Day. That might not mean a lot to you because for you, St. Patrick's Day is in the past, but for us, it's happening right now. And I couldn't ignore that little detail today. All right, so what if, what's what's in the envelope? The Leprechaun Horror Series <laughs> has many entries in it. Is it the, Most of them star Warwick Davis, I believe. I believe they uh, do, yes. one or more of them, the Leprechaun Raps. At least two. And I thought about it, tell me. Yeah. And I just couldn't go there. I wanted something lighter, something more fanciful. So won't you come with me on this journey back to the Emerald Isle for a little piece of of fantasy known as Darby O'Gill and the Little People. You know, there was a moment I suspected that this would be today's movie, and then I went, no, he would. (laughs) He's seen this. It was on cable every day when I was growing up. I definitely saw bits and pieces of it. I remember the Banshee scene. But I don't think I sat down and watched it start to finish. I am glad you've got this on DVD. The version that's on Disney Plus right now is a redub over the main character because I think they thought his accent was too incomprehensible. Oh. So if I go and try and watch this online, it is not the movie I saw when I was a kid. Released in 1959, D-O-A-T-L-P stars Albert Sharp, Janet Monroe, Sean Connery, and Jimmy O'Day. It was directed by Robert Stevenson, who previously brought us Old Yeller and directed many live-action movies for Disney. Producer Albert R. Broccoli saw Sean Connery in this film and decided to cast him in his most famous role, playing international spy James Bond in 1962's Dr. No et al. Off of this? Yep. Tony, nothing would make me happier today than for your gift to be... I think that damn light just burned out. Son of a bitch. All right, the lighting crew has changed the light bulb and we're visible again, so (laughs) let's continue the show. Shall we? Nothing would make me happier today than for your gift to be a crock of gold. But you'll have to settle for a couple steps below the next best thing. Oh, for a moment I thought it was actual money, but then I realized (laughs) it's too large. It's player money. I will be taking this to the quick trip and the police... We'll be called. (laughs) We'll slide on down to the end of the rainbow that is the old leather couch as we take in a little bit of fanciful entertainment with Darby O'Gill and the little people. Hey! In the little Irish town of Rathcullen, the widow Sugru goes to visit Katie O'Gill. Her son, Pony Sugru, is one of Katie's suitors. He's a huge jerk. And the widow tells her she should marry Pony. Many a lass has lost her mark. Oh, stop breathing your vulture breath on me. You miss me meaning. It's not a gassoon doesn't want you. I'm not getting a word of this. Not one word. I can see why they dubbed it. There's not a grassoon done one here. 
Whatever that is. Him to catch the town. Who to catch the town? The pony thought no small. Oh, the pony thought about to tie. You should be looking ahead, Katie. Jambi, hello. Nice to see you. Merciful heavens, it's Lord Fitzpatrick himself. Hello, Katie. Where's your father? He's off in his drinkings. I think he'll have gone to have the smithy sharpen his scythe. I'll fetch him for you, Lordship. I don't need no smithy sharpening my scythe. My scythe is plenty sharp on its own. If you know what I'm saying. I'm talking about my penis. I wagered that. <laughs> Her father is Darby O'Gill. He's the caretaker of Lord Fitzpatrick's land here in the village. His wife, her mother, is dead for obvious Disney reasons. He likes to go to the pub and tell stories of the little people who live up in the hill of Knocknashiga. And their king, Brian Connors. He's seen the little people for himself. Now the night was dark. As you will see in the flashback. <laughs> see? See how dark it is? And the moon was no bigger. The moon was Norwegian? No bigger. <laughs> in out your ears. I can't the understand. Daft if this was only dubbed into normal talk. King Brian, me old boy, oh, I've got you at last. And he managed to get his hands on his crock of gold. Why, this is only a little bit of gold. It's mostly a crock of monkey's paws. What about your fourth wish? He was tricked by the little man into making a fourth wish. And when you do that... Three wishes I grant you, great wishes are small. But you wish a fourth one and you lose them all. <laughs> the house always wins, Tony. The house always wins. If that leprechaun granted me three wishes, I'd say, crock of gold, I'm done. I'm walking away from the table. I'll take my crock of gold and, and you can keep the other two wishes. You're just going to have a leprechaun hanger on or he's bound by the leprechaun code. Yeah. We didn't see you, father. I didn't want to interrupt. I just came in for some quality blaspheming. There's going to be a new bell installed at the chapel, and the local clergyman needs someone to go to Glen Cove with a wagon to pick it up. Pony offers to do it for some money, but Darby offers to do it for free. Your gift will be the music of the bell. The music of the bell for me? I'll collect all the royalties. <laughs> from ASCAP and BMI. <laughs> that is going to bring prosperity to you and, and I wanted to make sure I quote the movie on this, your seed breeding generation. There are some great Irish phrases in this movie. Save me presents, Father Murphy, but it's needed at the house. Never thought I'd have the pleasure of seeing your lordship so soon. And he brings this young fellow Michael McBride. I've decided to settle him here in your place. So I'm going to retire you on half pay. Darby's not surprised. He knew this was coming. But he asks Michael not to tell Katie. He's going to take care of it himself. This is Mr. Uh, McBride. Mr. McBride is coming to resort. He's come to deflower you. Oh, Kitty. Did he just say, oh, titty? <laughs> I can't understand a word this old man is saying. Darby's horse escapes. He goes after it. Turns out he's not chasing a horse. He's chasing a puka, a mischievous Irish spirit. <laughs> a bunch of little leprechauns find him. He wanders into the hall of the little people. Where there's gold and treasures and merry dancing. And right there is Brian Connors, the king. And here's the sword of Brian Baru, who drove out the Danes. And slew the Norwegian moon. The soul of music shed. I... No shit. <laughs> he definitely said shit. Since you're in the land of the little people, now you can never leave. You have to stay here forever. Darby needs to get back to Katie. Your heart's as cold as a wet Christmas. <laughs> Darby is also a fiddle player. King Brian gives him the finest fiddle ever made, a Stradivarius. <laughs> Terrible. Smash. What are you some kind of Jimi Hendrix now? <laughs> Smashing a Stradivarius like it's nobody's business? Oh, devil take you. Dancing, whiskey, and hunting. And whoring. And he decides to entertain the leprechauns with a little bit of fiddle music. The fox chase. Oh, look at him. He's crip walking. <laughs> dancing, dancing, dancing. Which whips them into the hunting spirit. <laughs> They have little horses? Of course they got little horses. Mini ponies. 
This is just like the end of Heaven's Gate. King Brian opens the magic entrance to let the leprechaun hordes out into the night. Darby makes good on his opportunity to escape, just barely making out of the cavern in time. He goes back home. He knows that King Brian is going to come visit him and he's going to be mad. I've a good mind to break your back! I'd like to see you try, short stack. But Darby knows that if he can get the king to stay out until dawn, then the king loses all of his powers and he's under Darby's control. And he's going to do that with a jug of Puchin, which is like an extra strength Irish liquor. Here, king, have a drink. Hey, let's sing this song. The Wishin' Song, an improvised drinking song. I wish I had time to sing you a song, but when I get started, I sing all night long. <laughs> Welcome to improv class. I'll take a suggestion <laughs> from the audience. <laughs> oh, singing's no sin, and drinking's no crime. If you have one drink only, just one at a time. <laughs> oh, I'm done with all this. Somebody put peanut butter on the top of my mouth and I don't like it one bit. And the king is getting blotto. Oh, I wish that all mortals were like my friend Darby. He's full of butty, but he's... Blarbity Flarby. Before he knows it, the rooster crows and the king is trapped. You ain't jumping through shit. <laughs> He curses Darby out, but then Darby pulls out his secret weapon, a cat. There once was a cat who wanted to eat. He tore apart Brian with claws on his feet. <laughs> oh, some taste like chicken and some taste like turkey. But you'll never know till you try leprechaun jerky. <laughs> Darby says, I'll be having me three wishes now, but you're not going to do what you did to me last time. I'll make one. Go on, go on. But you'll be at my beck and call for a fortnight at least until I make the other two wishes. Darby puts the king in a sack and tosses him in a trunk. Morning. Good morning, 007. <laughs> she is my dear, my darling one. Her eyes so sparkling full of fun. No other, no other. I'd like to knock her boots. I love the ground she walks upon. I'd love to tap that ass. What have we got here? Martinis, stirred, unfortunately. Night comes, and Darby's wandering around with his sack. Someone tackles him. It's Michael McBride. He thinks that Darby is a poacher. There's been people poaching rabbits on the grounds. So I'm going to show you first. Take a look inside. Tell me what you see. <laughs> it's a good thing rabbits don't have middle fingers. King Brian is a tricky sort. I wish you could see him. Granted. And that's your second wish. Oh, no. Michael and Katie are out on the hillside. Old school courting. It involves chasing and tackling. <laughs> chasing and tackling. <laughs> and eventually, there's a kiss. The old ladies are reading other people's mail, which is a federal offense in America, but this is Ireland, and I guess you can do whatever you damn well please. They find out about Michael, and they go and tell Katie. She blames Michael for coming and taking her father's job and his dignity. Michael proposes. I love you, Katie, and I think that you love me. Katie rejects. Darby is in the village pub. He is about to make his third wish. But there's a scuffle, and the king escapes. Pony is going to discredit Michael so he can have Katie all to himself. So he bonks him on the head, dumps whiskey all over him, so people think he's a drunk. Can you imagine a drunk in Ireland? Darby finds Michael, and Michael wakes up. Katie has run off into the hills. We gotta go find her. But then they hear a sound. Oh, it's a familiar sound to Darby because he heard this sound the night his wife died. It's the wail of the banshee. The banshee's going to get his daughter now. She's knocked down the cliff and injured. They encounter the banshee. It's scary. Hold me, Tony. Darby drives off the banshee. They bring her back to the gatehouse where the priest gives her the last rites. That banshee shows up again. Wow! It's the Widdesukru! Behind the Banshee is coming the Death Coach. It's coming for Katie. King Brian! What is it, man? I want to wish all this bullcrap away. Darby knows he's got one more wish left. Send it away! Hey, there's some things I can't even do. When the Death Coach comes, it's coming for somebody. Well, then I wish it would come for me instead of my daughter. Granted. Darby O'Kill. Darby O'Kill. Get in. 
Coming out of the rain. You'll catch your death. But well, never mind. <laughs> and is spirited away into the rainy night sky. I was on my way back home, and I says to myself, Brian, says I, tis at his side you should be. Oh, I got it. I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. I wish I could go with you all the way. I wish you could too. <laughs> you wished your fourth wish. And now your daughter's dead. So Darby doesn't have to die. And Katie still lives. The next day, of course, Darby is telling the tale of his magnificent adventures. Michael shows up and confronts Pony. He said, if I were you, I'd clout the blackguard in the face. Blackguard clout! They have a fight, and Michael wins. Oh, my little pony! Hold your wish, I'll have no more from you. Why didn't you name me Stallion? They get into a carriage and ride off. Michael and Katie sing about their upcoming marriage. And it's all because of Darby O'Gill and the little people. Well, our little visit with Mr. O'Gill and his little people did not leave my heart as cold as a wet Christmas. Sure, it was a fine film. A fine <laughs> film indeed. This movie was a favorite in my house growing up. My mom was a big fan of Irish folk music. And with that comes the culture, even in its disney filter of it still has a lot of that culture. It felt like there was a, a little bit of authenticity to it. The dialect and the accents of the actors is, is a real important part of the story. You get used to it. It's hard to understand at first, but it's like getting into a, a bath. You get accustomed to it, and suddenly you hear the, the words and they make sense. Very much so. You're almost, your brain is learning as you're watching it. So the idea that someone would say, like, well, no one's going to understand it. we got to dub in clear voices. That's just ludicrous. Albert Sharp is damn near incomprehensible at times, but by God, is he charming and vivid. Originally, they wanted a better known actor, Barry Fitzgerald, to yep. play this part. And while Barry Fitzgerald is a talented dude who can do anything, I love him in Going My Way, I don't think the movie would have been as good. Barry Fitzgerald has almost like a devilish face. He looks like a satyr. The casting in this movie is solid. Yeah. What about Sean Connery, though? I think he's sincere. He's got that young energy. Throughout most of the movie, I thought he's just too swarthy and too like intense for this role. And then you see him in that final scene where he lays out Pony Sugru. That's what Broccoli saw when he saw James Bond. Because he strides into that bar and he's totally cool and he's totally forceful. He and he's like, down. I'm going to beat your ass. I saw James Bond there. I remember the Banshee being a lot scarier when I was a kid, but that's natural. I think that's childhood for you. I thought the Banshee special effects were okay, but the special effects when he was in the Hall of the Little People, those were outstanding. I never looked at any part of that and thought, that looks fake. Never. And everybody's eye lines were matched up. This would not have worked nearly as well if it was animated. Because you really wouldn't get that... That sense of visual magic, like, I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. Well, we brought up that one of the most uh, interesting faces in that movie was uh, Widow Sue Gru, who we recognized. Oh, it's that lady. That's the funny lady. She was in The Producers. She did another movie. Was she in Murder by Death? Yes. She and Elsa Lancaster. Yeah, yeah. She played the old lady. I believe that actress lived to be 101. She was the oldest living member of the Screen well, Actors in, Guild. In this movie, she, she looked like she was 102. Yeah. Can you think of any flaws? Any cons? Um, I thought the side plot of the bell was pretty useless. It just did, kind of didn't need to be there. Yeah. It's kind of nice. See, the idea that he gives him the music of the bell, that's kind of nice, and that's probably an old Irish story. I think it's also useful to show... Pony Sugru's character real early. He nickels and dimes the priest over yep. doing this nice thing for the town. Darby is a good guy at heart. Yeah. And Pony is He's just a... Not a good guy. She's the Gaston of this town. <laughs> right. Darby O'Gill and the little people have gone back down below the hillside and we bid them a fond farewell. And now it's time for us to take a little crack at a feature we call Seen It. Seen It. I seen it. Sean Henry writes, Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Tom Baker makes an excellent evil magician. Seen it. Seen it. That was apparently what the producers of Doctor Who went to the movie theater to see him in, as it was his most recent work. 
to see if he was Doctor Who material. And like Darby O'Gill, this is another example of great in-camera magic. Well, when you get Ray Harryhausen doing the effects, you get <clears throat> amazing things. And I, I always think about these movies, the Sinbad movies, and even Clash of the Titans. Uh, you wonder, are they magical because we saw them when we were kids? Or is there some inherent quote-unquote ma magic in the movie magic that isn't present today? And I, I, I'm not sure what the answer is to that. It really feels like there's personality behind these effects. They're not going to feel real. They're never going to feel real, but no, they feel... And they didn't when I was a kid watching it. Yeah. I didn't think that looked real. I thought it looked fake. But it was still super cool because that's how they did it. Yeah. And, and you know, they brought these fantasies to visual life. And it doesn't have to look realistic because we know it's not. But they're striking and they're unusual. Yeah. Ryan Castrillo says, Poor things. We relished every aspect of the film and stood outside in the cold talking in pure analysis of the film for nearly an hour straight. That's uh, the right way to end the night at the movies. Seen it. The world building in this movie is just really extraordinary and it's just such a pleasure. Every step of her journey, she enters this new world of sights and sounds and strange dances. I think that's the nice part of is for a character who's experiencing the world for the first time, we are experiencing this particular world with her together. Yeah, it's this bizarre, psychosexual Jane Austen journey of this feral girl child. Not only discovering womanhood, but discovering humanity. It's this weird, perverse, surreal, and occasionally just raw sense of humor that yeah. comes out of strange situations. For our next two scenes, we have uh, some DVDs that were sent into our P.O. box. This one was sent in by Columbia Studios. This is our first and only corporate sponsorship. They sent us this box set of DVDs. Nice. And it's, it happened one night. It's a movie that holds up in a modern way. Because it's so daring and and sexual in its very subtle ways. There is a weird editing flub in this. Yeah. Clark Gable is basically doing a striptease because she won't go to her side of yes. the walls of Jericho. He's starting to take off his pants and she dashes for the thing. There's a tight shot on her and she starts to go, eh? and then it cuts to a wider shot and she's like that and then she runs. The action doesn't match. It's really blatantly sloppy editing. And I'm thinking, whoever remastered this could have fixed that. And did they not do that because of some sort of historical preservation of the film? Like, we need to leave in this mistake because this mistake was always there, and so it's going to stay there. Is it a mistake? Or, because I know in some movies, in... It's, it's definitely a mistake. Well, be because there's a thing, and I know it's especially in, like, Hong Kong action movies, where they do this doubling of action, where they it's, cut on this. It's not that. It's, it's, it <laughs> it is, is totally a mistake. It is totally, totally a mistake. Well, then that editor shouldn't have gotten drunk <laughs> that night. I think my favorite part of the movie is the conversation that Gable has with Colbert's father. Yeah, I love her. So what? The father says... Do you love my daughter, sir? And he's like, love your daughter? Why, I think the sap who gets saddled with your daughter, he should give her a smack every day, whether she deserves it or not. And then the father later on, he goes to her and says, I like him. You should marry him. <laughs> T.A. Epley sent the basement this gorgeous Arrow Academy Blu-ray of Robert Altman's images, which Matt was kind enough to loan to me. So I seen it. Seen it. I don't know if this is Altman's only foray into horror. It's really the horror of confusion. And uncertainty. I'm scared to death because I don't know what I'm supposed to be scared of. The menace is always there, but there's never really any telegraphing of when it's going to show up. I made the mistake of watching this by myself late at night. Was not prepared for the consequences <laughs> of it. And it's just so dreamlike. Well, two things that I noticed about this. One, mm -hmm. Marcel the Creep looks almost exactly like Ted Bundy. Every time he came on camera, I was like, <laughs> everybody run. Get out of the house. He's Ted a, Bundy's in the room with you. Bad, bad man. Yeah. And then they do this funny thing. I don't know if you noticed this, where the characters and the actors swap names. Yes, I did. So like Susanna York plays a character named Catherine, and then the actress 
is named Catherine, and she plays a character named Susanna. Hugh and Marcel and Renee all rotate names. Yeah, yeah, and I, th- I think that's a sly way of addressing the idea of shifting identities in the in the story. Go and check out our website, welcome to the basement show.com. Click on the PayPal donation button. Some fine people donate to support our show and we appreciate it. Go there and click on those buttons and donate. I want to shout out some of our recent donors. Sh- oh, <laughs> Sharon and Philip who both gave very generous one-time donations and our brand new monthly donor Lance. Lance. Tony will be back next week for unboxing. We're going to have some fun there, and you'll have some fun if you are there with us. And now, take a look at this. Katie! 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 Katie!